Maybe. All right. So we'll be starting in about one minute. We're recording now and the audience is joining us. All right, let's kick this off. Good morning. This is the Arizona Capital Times Morning Scoop. I'm Gary Grotto, the executive editor of the Arizona Capital Times, where we cover state government, politics, and public policy. And this is where we talk about public policy and other important matters of public interest. Today, we're going to discuss one of the hottest, hottest topics around, and that's water. And Arizonans have been spoiled, especially in the desert where we can lounge by our pools, water our grass and, and let our teens take 45 minute showers without a worry or, or you know, a real hit to our pocketbooks. But you know, things have changed and they might change even more. And our panel today is gonna to discuss our water situation, what we can expect in the coming months and what actions our policymakers and consumers can take so we maintain our quality of life while addressing this water crisis. Uh, we couldn't have this discussion, however, without our sponsors. And today we have the Central Arizona Project, Arizona's single largest resource for renewable water supplies. CAP delivers Colorado River, river water to Maricopa, Pinal, and Pima counties and serves more than 80% of the state's population, including agriculture land and is the largest supplier to the trade to the tribes. Thank you, CAP, for sponsoring our program today. And our other sponsor is EPCOR, which provides clean water and safe, reliable energy to communities in Canada and the United States. EPCOR USA is among the largest private water utilities in the Southwest and the largest in Arizona, providing water, wastewater, wholesale water, and natural gas services to approximately 780,000 people across 42 communities and 18 counties in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Thank you very much, EPCOR. And now I wanna welcome Terry Goddard. He's the board president of the Central Arizona Water Conservation District. Terry was the Phoenix mayor from 1984 to 1990, and he was our attorney general from 2003 to 2011. And Terry is here today to offer some introductory remarks. And good morning, Terry. The floor is yours. Gary, I think we lost him from the feed. We lost Terry? Okay. Yeah, so we, you might want to go with your, your um, video while he tries to get back online. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry about that. And for now, I'd, I'd like to share a, a video from um, Step 4 and let me make sure that I do this right so that we don't lose everybody. Glance, this 10 acre public park is like many across the country, a tranquil green space where people gather, unwind, and play. But what lies beneath tells a very special story, one of engineering excellence and environmental stewardship. At EPCOR, we're always looking for pioneering ways to use water wisely. We developed an innovative partnership with the Anthem Community Council to create a community park on top of EPCOR's recharge facility, where treated effluent is recycled, helping to irrigate public spaces and recharge the underground aquifer. Approximately five miles away, EPCOR's award-winning Anthem water treatment plant takes in an average of 1.6 million gallons of wastewater every day which is treated and purified at the highest levels with advanced membrane technology. Nearly 100% of that treated effluent is delivered to the recharge site via a pipeline and continuously soaks deep into the ground until it reaches the aquifer some 400 feet below the surface. 
Residents can enjoy the park without ever knowing they are taking part in a complex system designed to renew the water cycle. Projects like this are the reason EPCOR was named a utility of the future by the Water Environment Federation and honored with a director's award of recognition from the Environmental Protection Agency. In the desert Southwest, where water is a precious resource, we must find creative ways to responsibly use and reuse it. Anthem Opportunity Way Park achieves this innovative conservation goal while giving the community something they can be proud of. Okay. Thank you for that, EPCOR. And <clears throat> now I'd like to introduce our panel. First, we have Joe Geisel. Joe's the president of EPCOR USA, an indirect wholly owned subsidiary of EPCOR Utilities Incorporated. Joe is responsible for water, wastewater, and natural gas services to over 780,000 people through more than 305,000 service connections in 42 communities in 18 counties across Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And Joe was recently appointed to the newly formed Arizona Reconsulta Reconsultation Committee. The ARC is charged with developing Arizona's perspective on long-term management of the Colorado River system, which will play an important role in new guidelines the Bureau of Rec Reclamation will issue by the end of 2026. Good morning, Joe, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. And next we have Ted Cook. He's the general manager of the Arizona <clears throat> Central Arizona Project. Ted was appointed GM in March 2016. Previously, he was a general interim general manager and deputy general manager for finance and administration. Ted joined CAP in uh, 1999 and has a 40-year career in utilities, technology, finance, and operations. Welcome, Ted, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. And we have Tom Bushatsky. He's Tom is the director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources and chairman <clears throat> of the Arizona Water Banking Authority. Tom brings with him more than 30 years of water management, and he's responsible for managing Arizona's water supply. Good morning, Tom, and welcome. And also, Good morning. also joining us is Dave Roberts. Dave is the Associate General Manager and Chief Water Resources Executive at the Salt River Project. Dave oversees several SRP functions, including water supply planning and reservoir operations, water rights, water strategy, water measurement, groundwater resource management, including water banking and water supply development and acquisitions. Dave has worked for Salt River Project for 35 years. And prior to coming to SRP, Dave worked for the Arizona Department of Water Resources and the Bureau of Reclamation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And one last thing before we uh, begin the discussion, I want to encourage the audience to submit your questions through the chat and participate with our panelists. So um, as we were talking before we started uh, uh, the live stream, um, I was telling you gentlemen that, you know, when the drought, you know, really came into the awareness of the media and so forth, you know, um, there was kind of a feeling of, uh, at least for me, that, yeah, there's a drought and somebody's taking care of it. But now, lately, you know, what we're reading about, it, it seems like, you know, it's a bathtub that's draining. Is that what's happening, Tom? And can you set the scene for us for the, for the situation that's going on? Sure, Gary. And I'm going to go a little backwards compared to what I usually do. And usually I talk about the challenges, and then we talk about what some of the tools are to address the challenges. I want to make sure because of the serious nature of this drought we're in and where we're heading with Lake Powell and Lake Mead and Colorado River water for Arizona, that people understand there are some solutions out there that are already in place and solutions on the horizon. And you mentioned the Arizona Water Banking Authority. They have over 4 million acre feet of water stored under the ground. The backfill shortages to municipal industrial uh, contractors for CAP and also for some Indian tribes. But there's also millions of acre feet of water stored underground by individuals like EPCOR and other cities, SRP, et cetera. So we have that uh, resource available to us. Since 1980, the idea of the 1980 groundwater code was to protect our groundwater 
for also the drought periods that we would face. We also have in the bipartisan federal infrastructure bill billions of dollars for things like recycling of reclaimed water, desalination, drought management, augmentation, lots of opportunity there. And there have been discussions within our state about an Arizona Water Augmentation Authority. So keep it in mind some of those solutions that are on the table and maybe on the table in the future. As I talk about the situation on the Colorado River, we've been in a drought for 22 years. It is the worst drought in 1200 years using reconstructed stream flow from tree rings. We've been mining essentially Lake Powell and Lake Mead since 1999 when they were last full. And now they are down to the point where Lake Powell's around 24% capacity in Lake Mead, about 30% capacity. And that resulted in 2022 for tier one of the drought contingency plan and 2007 guidelines in which Arizona has been already cut by 512,000 acre feet. Most of those cuts are for underground storage and farmers within the CAP service area. We're projecting for calendar year 2023 that we're gonna probably be in tier 2A, another 80,000 acre feet of cuts coming to the state of Arizona. Also the cuts will be attended to Mexico and to Nevada. California doesn't start taking cuts till elevation tier uh, 2B. We've done lots of conservation in Lake Mead, both recently and probably starting in about 2014. There's over 70 feet of purposefully conserved water in Lake Mead when you look at the cuts and the conservation. Without that, I couldn't even tell you how big the cuts to Arizona would be, but they would be much bigger than the cuts that we are uh, suffering right now or the corrupt cuts on the horizon for next year. So there are actions we have been taking collectively among the states and with Mexico and the United States government there are actions we have taken in the state of Arizona. Arizona has really stepped up recently. In 2022, Arizona will have over 800,000 acre feet of its Colorado River water sitting in Lake Mead between conservation that's been compensated or the cuts that we've been forced to take under the law of the river. So I will leave that uh, as the background and we can move on to other speakers or additional questions. Sure, and um, we have Terry Goddard back. Um, the uh, guys in the control room must have lost you. And um, welcome back, sir. And, and you know, I'm gonna give you a moment to, to uh, give those remarks that you were gonna give earlier. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, hopefully I'm coming through now, is that right? Yes, you okay. are. Uh, well, on behalf of the Central Arizona Project Board of Directors, I want to welcome you to this morning scoop on water shortage. And Tom has just laid out uh, the somber facts that we are facing, uh, and I'm not going to repeat them. It's a, it's a incredible challenge. Just a year ago, uh, the morning scoop was discussing whether or not we might be facing a tier one shortage. <clears throat> sure enough, the secretary declared one in August and 512,000 acre feet came out of the CAP canal, one third of the total deliveries to central Arizona. Uh, so we're facing a very serious problem. Back on May the 6th, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, the CAP and the Arizona Department of Water Resources together briefed citizens about the shortage. And that was a session Terry, can you hear us? Because I know that uh, their remarks are going to deal with how we face this crisis, how do individuals, businesses, tribal governments, and cities make changes as we're going to have to do in the future. So I, I, I hope that's going to be the kind of answers that we're going to get today. And thank you very much. And I apologize for, for coming in. Have the greeting uh, after one of the major speakers has already teed it up. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Well, 
<clears throat> and um, so uh, th this next question now that, that Tom has kind of um, set the stage, um, Ted, you know, what, what's the impact of the next tier of shortage on cap water users if the drought continues to get worse? Well, thank you, Gary, and good morning again. And uh, Tom gave a, a very um, comprehensive overview of kind of where we're, where we're at and how we got here. Um, and between, as he said, between the 2007 guidelines and the drought, that was from 2007, and the drought contingency plan in 2019, Arizona in, in the tier one shortage that we're in, in 2022 uh, is, is 512,000 acre feet. This is, as Terry said a moment ago, all being absorbed by, by CAP, Central Arizona Project uh, customers, except maybe a couple thousand acre feet on river. As we go into a tier 2A, as we expect in 2022, that's another 80,000 acre feet. If, and, and, uh, and, uh, below, and that is at elevation 1050 in Lake Mead. And, and uh, starting at elevation 1050, one of the things that the drought contingency plan did was it has these, these five foot increments in the lake now going down between um, tier, tier two starting at 1050 and tier three, which starts at 1025. So the next, the next tier after that, which could happen in 2024, and there's some possibility of it happening in 2023, uh, would be another 48,000 acre feet for Arizona. And that will also be um, um, uh, absorbed by, by CAP. So 512,000 acre feet in a tier one, 592,000 acre feet in a, in a tier two A and 640,000 acre feet in a tier two B. And then if we get to a tier three, uh, which could happen also in 24 or 25, that would be 720,000 acre feet uh, all of which would be taken by CAP, except for uh, a small amount on, on the river. As Tom pointed out, um, we are already doing um, over 800,000 acre feet in Arizona of Colorado River reduction. So we're already beyond what a tier, a tier three would require us to do in 2022 while we're in a tier one. And uh, that was in, due in part to a uh, so-called 1030 consultation, where if we saw projections uh, showing the lake continuing to decline beyond 1025, any time in the next two years, that uh, in, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, min probable case, which is a, a, tenth a 90th percentile case, that uh, we had to do something else. So that something else led to something called the 500 plus plan. And that's why we're doing most of this extra conservation. Um, uh, going back to, to a tier, tier one who's impacted mostly in a tier one uh, would be Central Arizona agriculture, uh, which is the lowest priority uh, CAP uh, water user priority. Um, and also um, some of the next priority tier, <coughs> excuse me, called the NIA priority that is held by cities and tribes. Importantly though, in tier one and, and uh, tier two, there is some mitigation, which is there's water and money that was put aside ahead of time to help alleviate those first large steps into, sh into shortage, but that declines over time. So uh, the, the next steps of, of shortage in tier 2A and tier 2B, even though they're smaller than the initial one, um, they, they have a more impact because there's less mitigation. And eventually the mitigation will go away in, in, uh, in 2025 or when we get into a tier three, whichever happens, happens first. I need to point out that, and I know I'm throwing lots of numbers around and complicated uh, uh, concepts and so forth, but, and Tom already had made this point that everything that we have been doing, whether it is in these agreements that have been made like the draft contingency plan um, or the 500 plus plan, the voluntary conservation that we're doing, that, well, all of this is leading to that 70 feet in the lake that Tom mentioned uh, that has been put into the lake. If that wasn't there, we would already be well beyond a tier three and we would have been subject already at this point to undefined involuntary reductions imposed by the Secretary of the Interior. That is all, what all of these efforts have been designed to avoid so that we have something predictable and as painful as it is, we know what it is, we know what it's going to happen, we know it's going to, who it's going to impact, then we have an, an opportunity 
to address those impacts ahead of time. Um, that being said, our major reservoirs, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, are, are nearing uh, minimal elevations before um, they, they can um, uh, not reliable, reliably deliver water past the dam. And, and this is our, our next challenge that we have to face. Um, and we have a, a little bit more time left to do these voluntary types of things, but we still face that potential that the United States will have to take uh, swift and decisive action with that without much notice. So this is why all of us, Tom and, and myself and, and, and uh, other water leaders like Joe and Dave are asking our water users, uh, even those who, who may not be impacted until we get into a tier three to look for what we can do today to conserve more and to do more voluntarily so that we can push out that, that uh, next, next step that we have to take a little bit further in time. But there will be next steps and they will be soon and they, and they will be significant and beyond even the tiers that have been defined. So at this point, you're, there's a high likelihood that we're gonna to go to the next tier um, by this August? Yeah, yes, um, there, there is literally no chance of staying in tier one at this point uh, for 2023. It will be at least a 2A and there's some possibility that it might be a tier 2B in 2023. And I guess the question is, you know, uh, when does it hit the tap? And I know Joe was, was saying before um, we started talking um, that everywhere you go, everybody's asking you about the water shortage, right? And how it's going to impact them. Yes, that's, that's correct. And good morning and thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think awareness uh, which was something we've lacked, even though we've been in a drought for the last decade or more. Uh, awareness, which was there, but really not appreciated. I think that's starting to raise right now as uh, we start to get more visibility on what's happening with the Colorado River and in Lakes Powell and Lakes Mead and what actions we have to take. Uh, from our perspective with our customers, uh, we have best management practices, which talk about conservation, how we can reduce more water, uh, various types of uh, zero scape types of things. All of these are voluntary. And you know the voluntary side of it means everybody has to do their part to do it. One, one of the challenges that we still face is that there's no real economic signal to drive behavior. And that's a very difficult thing to get across because if you think of your water bill in relation to what other things that drive your household needs, uh, your water bill is less than a tank of gas. And that's to serve all of your water that you get today. Yet we focus on the price of gas. So unless we get our heads around how we're going to get beyond voluntary and you know, incentives can come in a number of different ways. Uh, we have a tiered rate structure across our districts so the more you use, the last tier becomes more and more expensive, which tends to give a signal to customers that you know, conservation is very, very good. We, we do canvas our customers on what's important to them and conservation continues to be the highest value that they perceive. And it's the old adage, the, the cheapest gallon is the one you save, not the one you gotta go search for. So, I think there's a number of avenues that we have to go forward to with our customers, with our regulators, as we move toward getting this voluntary uh, movement from our customers to conserve more and more water. Okay. Um, Dave, uh, you know, what other parts of our infrastructure are impacted by the water shortage? Well, thank you for the question, Gary. Good morning. Um, as, uh, as Ted and Tom talked about, uh, obviously the one big impact is um, if we don't get enough water into Lake Powell, we're not gonna be able to use the facility as we used it historically. Um, and there's risks to how much water can be uh, delivered from Lake Powell into Lake Mead if the drought continues. And so that's a big challenge that also impacts power generation out of uh, Glen Canyon Dam as well. Um, closer to home, uh, obviously the, uh, the municipal water treatment plants are located, many of them on 
canals and, and several of them are on the CAP canal. There are a number of them on SRP's canal as well. So, you know, if water levels uh, drop too far, um, they can impact operations of those water treatment plants on the CAP canal, um, things of that nature. Um, you know, the other thing Tom talked about, all the water that's been stored underground, uh, obviously we're gonna be impacted by having to recover that water and, and pump it out. So, um, and being able to move that supply to where it can be utilized effectively by CAP customers will be a challenge as well. So those are the things that, that impact uh, that from an infrastructure standpoint that can be impacted by drought. Um, and um, we're working uh, with CAP and others to, to try to address those issues as we go along. Okay. And, and Ted, you know, um, a few weeks ago when you were doing the Colorado River um, shortage review, you mentioned the steps that we're going to take before it, it hits the, the, um, the tap. Um, can you, uh, you know, go through those steps? Uh, you know, um, I, one I recall was that, you know, outside water usage is going to be one of the first to, to go or be impacted um, substan substantially. Um, yes, that was one of the messages on our on our May sixth joint uh, water briefing um, that ADWR Department of Water Resources and CAP did. Um, but let's back up just just a little bit. Uh, excuse me to my earlier comments that uh, that uh, the next tier of shortage two um, A uh, and potentially two B will begin to cut into higher priority municipal and and Indian uh, party water supplies. Not a lot, but some. And this has come a lot sooner, I think, than we expected even, even um, a year ago or so. Now, I have to say that our municipal and tribal customers, many of them, if not all of them, are quite sophisticated and have, have put in um, a number of, um, of uh, uh, processes to avoid this type of situation where we have to tell, where they have to tell their customers that they need to turn off the tap. They have, uh, some of them have more than one water supply. It don't depend entirely on CAP and Colorado River water. They have water from the Salt River Project. They may be served by a private water company like, like EPCOR that, that gets maybe some of its water from us and some of its water from elsewhere. They may have access to groundwater. They may have stored water underground, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and so it is. This is this is both a benefit and a and a problem, as as uh, as as Joe brought up. Is is that folks do not notice this? They're sh they're buffered. They're shielded from from some of these these impacts by the ingenuity and the resources that their water providers have. Um, uh, there, th when municipal water providers and tribal water providers are impacted, at least over the next few years, they will be firmed. And this, this is a, a technical term um, for basically other water supplies that are available by those agencies who are responsible to firm them, which can be the state government, it can be the federal government. Um, and so once again, this is a, this is a, a, a step, a mechanism that has been put into place to, to offset these impacts when they occur, at least in, in, the, initial, in the initial stages. Um, and one of the reasons why Tom and I and, and other water managers are, are uh, asking everyone to take a look at what, what they can do. So uh, it, the, the, the tap will be the last thing that will be impacted and we hope to avoid that at all if, if, if possible. But after agriculture and agriculture um, consumes over 70% of Arizona's water supply. And this is for food for people and food for animals and also um, uh, fiber. Uh, for clothing and, and uh, industrial uses. Um, but, at, but after that, uh, the next major user is municipal and industrial. Um, and within that envelope of municipal, the largest water use is outdoor water. So, and that is about the same ratio in, in many areas, which is uh, over half and sometimes more of the water that's being used is not used within the home. It's not used for cooking and, and, and drinking and things like that. It is used for um, shrubbery and, and plants and, and pools and things like that. Not that those things are bad or evil, but we're trying to um, 
uh, produce better awareness about where water use actually occurs so that folks can look at, and this is individual um, um, residents and also um, uh, pr water providers look to see um, as, the, as the reductions, whether they're um, programmatic or whether they're voluntary come, that they know where to look to get this water that is needed to conserve. And it actually has to show up in the reservoirs to, to, to do the good that it needs to do. Saving water is important, but where the savings goes is, is also very, very important. So I hope, I hope that answered your question, or at least started to answer it. Yeah, and um, when, when you say, you know, when it reaches the tap, are we just talking about, um, you know, uh, extra conservation or, or restrictions, or are we talking about price as well? Because Joe was just talking about how, you know, your your water bill is less than a tank of gas. Well, it is, and I will speak just just for CAP here because that's of course who I, I represent, and, mm -hmm. and the water that we supply is raw surface water from the Colorado River. It is provided at cost. We do not have a mechanism to say, well, it's worth more than you're paying us for it, so we're going to increase the price. Our contracts don't allow us to do that. Um, uh, Joe mentioned on the other, and, and I, I may mention that the cost of raw water is a, is a relatively small proportion of the delivered treated water to most residential users because it has to be treated. There's a distribution system to get it there. There's meterings and, 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 th and other infrastructure and things like that. All the costs are important, but I wanted to put that in perspective. Uh, so we, we, we can't, CAP can't artificially control the, the price to a, a higher level. Um, and, and there's some, there's not complete agreement as to, well, what would the price need to be before people took notice and say, holy cow, I'm gonna do whatever I can because this is ridiculous to have to spend you know, $100 a gallon or whatever the price might be to get people's attention um, or even, even a dollar a gallon. Um, but the cities, as Joe mentioned, and the private water providers do have the ability to put in tiered um, uh, rate structures, which basically says the more you use, the higher rate you pay per unit. Um, obviously, the more you use, the more you pay, but, but it's incrementally higher per unit as well. And that has some impact on getting folks' attention to reduce water use. I would point out, though, in, in, in all of us who, who live in a, in, a, in, a, in a home, which I assume is everyone uh, that's on this call, um, all the water that goes to your home is treated. It bears all of those costs. And so whether you use it for something like um, 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 drinking or bathing or cooking, uh, or you use it to water your plants or fill your pool, it's all treated water. It's all the same type of water. And, and um, most of it um, uh, that doesn't evaporate um, from, from your pool and in, in, um, uh, enviro, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, evapotranspiration from, from your, your plants in your yard uh, will hopefully go down your, your drain into the sewer so that it can be treated and used for something else rather than just going into the street or something like that. Um, so there are many, many opportunities for folks to, to um, uh, save water, understanding that, that um, uh, reuse is, is a, um, a, an, another supply that's available to us if we don't waste it. So we can save it, save it at the front end by, by using less and save it at the back end by making sure that we don't waste it into the, into the air or into the, into the street. So um, <clears throat> I have a question from our audience. Um, any serious discussions occurring to amend the Colorado River Compact? So Gary, let, let me jump in. Yeah. Please. <laughs> so when we say the Colorado Compact, it's too narrow a scope of what we're talking about here. We're talking about the compact. We're also talking about the law of the river that has arguably affected the compact since 1922 when it was put together. So if the question is, are we gonna throw out the law of the river and the compact and start over again? The answer is absolutely not. What we're going to do is make changes to how we operate the system, potentially changes how we allocate water, things like that, that effectively create amendments to the compact and the law of the river. The drought contingency plan in 2019 was one such action that 
took federal legislation to help implement that drought contingency plan. So we are looking for creative ways to improve on the framework, but there's a certain baseline level of certainty with which we value that certainty in terms of putting together these future actions in dealing with, with the river. So uh, to start all over again would probably end up in a place of complete chaos. Uh, we don't have the time to deal with the chaos. We have the time to make tweaks to the system. Some are major tweaks, some might be considered to be minor tweaks. But yes, absolutely, we have and we will continue to tweak the law of the river to deal with the issues that face us <clears throat> and to deal with the long-term impacts of the declining flow of the river that are clearly um, more than just drought. There is certainly a climate change element and the drier and hotter climate change today and future is clearly impacting the flow of the river as evidenced by the fact that the snowpack, et cetera, the precipitation in the river, in the watershed is not resulting in the same amount of runoff into the river that we've seen in uh, past history. Last year, we got 90% snowpack, essentially precipitation and only 30% runoff. This year, we're about 90% again, and we're probably gonna get 58 or 57 or some number in that range runoff in the river. And that's a trend we've seen in the last decade or two. And that's going to be a huge challenge moving forward in, in how we manage the river and what changes we make either legislatively or by agreement to the law of the river. Okay. So Joe, can you talk to us about a little bit about your reclamation projects that you've got going in Arizona? Or in Arizona? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so we have all of our wastewater treatment plants that we have are water reclamation facilities. And what that means is we treat them as the video showed before to a very high standard and recharge into the aquifer. So we probably recharge about 9 million gallons a day into the aquifer, which starts to build quite dramatically for us to help us with the stored resources that we're all looking to, to access should the drought continue. I would say that's probably the largest reclamation that we do within the state right now for us. And, and like I say, all of our plants are built to that very high standard as well. So, and then that, that goes to recharge, but also repurposing as well. So that's the other side of this, where we do use some of the, that reclaimed water for water features, some golf courses, uh, outside facilities that uh, perhaps do not need the high treated potable standard that you would need at your home. And uh, so that tries to help the water cycle for what we're doing. You said 9 million gallons of water a day? That's correct. I mean, um, yeah, it almost seems like you could uh, solve this problem with that amount, of, <laughs> that amount of water. Is that not a lot? or That, that is not a lot. That, that, that is not a lot. Yeah. 326,000 gallons in an acre feet. You can do the math at how much we're actually storing versus the volumes that Ted and uh, is talking about through CAP and what uh, Dave and SRP provide. So, uh, no, it's, it's a, it, it handles our water reclamation, our wastewater that we get back to the plants, which obviously creates credits for us on our future supply to our, our customers as well. But no, uh, that will not solve the problem in and of itself. Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to get a little perspective on you know the amounts of, uh, of water there. So um, here's another question from the, from the audience and it's kind of technical, but um, when the August Bureau of Reclamation 24 month projections come out, on which tier level for the calendar 2023 will be based? Will the actual level of Lake Mead be used or will it include an additional 480,000 acre feet of quote unquote virtual water retained in Lake Powell? Does that make sense? And um, let's see here. And when will- well, let, me, let me answer that Gary. And that right. gets to an action that Ted alluded to in his discussion and Dave about protecting the elevation of Lake Powell to be able to protect the infrastructure at Glen Canyon Dam to be able to continue to move water to Lake Mead, which of course means moving water through the Grand Canyon. So by agreement, by, by action of the secretary 
of the interior, 500,000, a million acre feet of water is in Lake Powell that would not have otherwise been there. Some of that's coming from Flaming Gorge Reservoir in the upper basin. And the other half of that's coming from leaving some water in Lake Powell that was slated to come to Lake Mead and to the lower basin. So in the May 24 month study, the actual elevation of uh, Lake Mead projected to the end of the year was uh, 1039.9, I believe. And the adjusted elevation with the net neutral accounting that was part of the secretary's decision on how to operate the system with this Lake Powell protection was 1047 and change. So what you will see in the August 24 month study my guess is they will show the actual elevation again, but they will also show the adjusted elevation, which will be used to make the tier uh, determination for 2023. And so what's really happening here is the, the risk at Lake Powell right now, despite how unhealthy Lake Mead is, is still greater than the risk at Lake Mead in terms of water deliveries and other impacts. And so we're shifting some risks temporarily hopefully, to Lake Mead to better protect Lake Powell and allow water to move past Glen Canyon Dam. And that's why this action was taken by the secretary. That's why this net neutral accounting is part of this decision process for the secretary. What that does mean is that if there is not a chance for the system to recover, or for us to take more cuts or for us to do more conservation system-wide, we could trigger a situation in which more risk then attends to Lake Mead and we've got to take some actions. And, and that outcome was in Assistant Secretary Trujillo's letter of May 3rd, that that was a potential possibility. So we're trying to balance as best we can both Powell and Mead and the risks in dealing with these really uh, low flow periods that we've seen the last 20 years and trying to protect both lakes and the entire system in as balanced a way as we possibly can. Okay. Um, so Dave, um, we talked a little bit beforehand about um, Bartlett Lake. Um, we had done a story this week or last week about um, expansion of it and uh, trying to um, increase its capacity. And um, so can you tell us a little bit about that and, and you know, how it fits into and, and how it'll help, um, you know, this, this problem that we have? Sure, uh, thanks for the question there, Gary. Um, the, uh, let me give you a little background first. We, uh, Salt River Project operates uh, two dams and reservoirs on the Birdie River. Uh, north of Phoenix. Uh, the upper reservoir and dam is called the Horseshoe Dam and Reservoir, built in the 40s. And then below that is, is the Bartlett Dam that you referred to that was built in the 30s. And the, the challenge that we've been facing at Horseshoe is that its capacity has been impacted by the, uh, the sediment flows that come off the upper part of the watershed there. In fact, uh, we've lost about a third of the capacity at Horseshoe. And so that impacts our overall ability to store water for our customers. Um, and the city of Phoenix also has a, a water right at Horseshoe and they're impacted as well. So several years ago, we started on a process to look at uh, the alternatives that we might uh, deploy to restore that capacity. And we evolved um, almost a couple hundred stakeholders in that review process. And the result of that uh, work uh, led to a recommendation to uh, recapture the loss capacity, but also expand the capacity of uh, Bartlett Dam and Reservoir. And so the concept is to move the existing capacity that exists at, Bar at Horseshoe into Bartlett, uh, restore the loss capacity at Horseshoe into Bartlett and to expand the size of Bartlett to capture even more water. And so uh, the concept is to, to raise uh, the two alternatives that are being looked at is to raise Bartlett either 62 feet or 97 feet. Um, and so we're embarking right now. The uh, 
the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act authorized SRP to work with Reclamation on a feasibility study to look at uh, raising the dam either 62 or 97 feet. The 97 foot raise would expand the capacity of Bartlett from 178,000 acre feet to 628,000 acre feet. And so that would partially be the restoration of lost capacity and also the movement of capacity from Horseshoe, but also create additional storage capacity for others here in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And so we have, um, we have 22 different partners that are working with us to fund this study. EPCOR is a partner, CAP is a partner uh, through the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District. And then we have a number of valley municipalities that are partner with us as well. And so the plan is to study the feasibility of this uh, possibility and that water supply would be utilized to offset shortages of Colorado River water, but also to um, help protect our groundwater supplies as well. Um, the yield from that would be on average a little over 100,000 acre feet per year. And so it's a substantial supply that could be made available in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And so um, it's just a project that we um, are, are very excited about. It, it has a, holds a lot of promise. Uh, I'll also tell you, we have another project that's on the, on the Salt River system at, at uh, Roosevelt Dam, which uh, if you are familiar with that dam, it was raised back in the nineties and it holds about three and a half million acre feet of water, but we only can functionally use about half of that. And so some of the capacity at Roosevelt is used for what's called flood control uh, purposes when we get those big runoff events. And so we are working with the Corps of Engineers to see if we might utilize a portion of that flood control space for uh, beneficial use purposes downstream. Uh, instead of releasing all that water into the riverbed, the idea would be to slowly release it out of that flood control space over a period of time and beneficially use it, and offset uh, Colorado River shortages, as well as providing supplies that offset groundwater pumping as well. So those are two projects that SRP is working uh, on its system with others to help uh, offset impacts of Colorado River shortages, but also help preserve groundwater in the valley as well. So. Okay. Sure. Tom was going to say something, but um, so uh, Gary, what I, what I wanted to say was yeah. I've been watching the chat, obviously. Right. And I want to throw out some kind of a bit of a holistic discussion here. So a lot of the chat was, what if we do X? What if we do Y? What if we do Z? So what I want to say is, you know, our policymakers, our elected officials, the legislature, the governor, boards of districts like Dave's and Central Arizona Project. Joe has his own board of directors, I'm sure. So we have these decision makers, these policy makers. They have to balance all of these things. They have to balance the reuse of reclaimed water, which in the metro areas in the state is all being put to use. It's not necessarily being uh, used for drinking water purposes, although that's being considered but it's being used for environmental purposes, for golf courses, for other valuable purposes. Some of it's used for agriculture. Then agricultural use itself, I've seen lots of things pop up about the need to have the food and fiber. That's another part of the discussion. Obviously we have municipal uses, people in their homes, we have businesses. These things are all trying to be balanced by how the elected officials put together the statutory structure and other policy decisions they're making which is for us, the people in this panel, to then implement those outcomes. And we've been doing this for a long time. We have a requirement that goes back to 2005 that all water providers in the state of Arizona who have 15 connections to municipal uses, to homes, have to have a drought management plan. So we were very proactive in understanding what we're facing now could come to us at some point in time. We heard what EPCOR is doing from Joe. We have Mesa, Scottsdale, Tucson, all having triggered stages of their drought management plan. Ted and I have made a pitch in our May 6th meeting and elsewhere to other water providers to potentially do those same things. So it's a big piece of a puzzle, lots of individual pieces in that big puzzle. 
that we're trying to balance all these things. And there are a lot of really hard policy decisions that have to be made to create this balance. And it's very difficult to point a finger at any one piece of that puzzle and say that's you know, the solution because it really can't work that way. So I just want the audience to understand that there is a big picture. The big picture is made up of individual pieces and it's really tough decisions when you look at each piece and what it gives you, what risks are attendant to those pieces and what tools we have to manage all the individual pieces. And Joe rightly, and as always on these panels, brought up the cost. I was listening on the radio coming in the other day to work. There was a story and it was a very negative story about a East Valley city who proposed a 2% rate increase and how horrible that was for the consumers. And probably that rate increase is in the neighbor of a dollar, neighborhood of a dollar or a dollar fifty per month in terms of the increase to that water bill. So Joe's points and others about the pricing and that signals they send or don't send is really important piece of the puzzle that probably gets less attention than maybe all the pieces of the puzzle that we've talked about today. With that, I'll stop. Gary, I think Tom, Tom makes a great point uh, on all that. And I, and I would also echo the fact that there's a great deal of uh, collaboration and coordination that goes on behind the scenes among all of us here on this panel and many others here in the Phoenix and Tucson and even in Pinal, uh, the Pinal AMA as well. There, there's a lot going on that, that people really don't see because they're it's not uh, highly visible. Um, but there's a, a great deal of effort to coordinate our water supply planning, coordinate our recovery of water in the future, our groundwater pumping, uh, conservation throughout our service territories. Uh, and we do a lot of work, all of us do a lot of work with other municipalities here in Arizona to, to address the, the, the challenges that we have going forward here. Yeah, and if I could just follow on Dave and Tom's commentary, it, it does cut, take a lot of investment to wring the towel, so to speak, to get the drops in the right spot in the right places. Uh, our company probably spends 40 to $50 million annually just to make sure that we can get our water losses to our customers below 10%. We're around 7% right now. Talked about 9 million gallons a day to re-inject. Those are pretty high level treatment plants. It's just not an old lagoon system. And you know we're building an $80 million one, one down in uh, Pinal, down in Santan, the old Johnson Utility franchise, which will add another 4 million gallons a day. We're repurposing out at Luke Air Force Base. It's about a $42 million expansion to add another 3 million gallons a day. So all of that gets wound up and we do have regulators who monitor us very closely and basically put the governor on any rates that you can pass on through the customers. It's all cost-based, but at the end of the day, we have to invest a lot of money. And a lot of times that's Kind of falls on some deaf ears to some customers. Some customers are very knowledgeable, very supportive, but at the end of the day, sometimes the rates have to go up, and uh, we don't like doing that. We work very hard to make sure we're prudent on our costs, but uh, in order to get the water in the right spot at the right time and the right quality, it does take a lot of investment. Well, let me let me ask this of the entire panel, and whoever wants to weigh in, please. Um, you know, so lawmakers can be very parochial and. You know, only a handful seem to be really engaged in water issues. Um, so if, if you're speaking to a joint session of the legislature, how would you explain to the body that this water shortage impacts their individual constituents? So Gary, I've had, have had opportunity to do that in the context of the water, the new water authority legislation. I've been down at the legislature in both the Senate and Democrat caucuses for both parties. And so I try to establish the facts about what's facing us. I try to make sure they understand what tools are available to us. And we talked before about <clears throat> potential impacts to the tap. It's not, in my opinion, the tap inside your home. We are a long ways away from that and maybe never at a point where we're gonna say you can't 
take a shower. It's about outdoor war use, which I think somebody mentioned before is about 70%. And again, I don't have the authority to make the water providers trigger their drought management plans. They're required to have them filed with me, but it's up to them. And that is because their water portfolios, their customer bases, their mix of residential, commercial, et cetera, is, is different for every single water provider. No two water providers are the same. So they have to tailor their actions to their customer base and to their service areas, <clears throat> to what infrastructure they have or don't have. So those are difficult decisions. And, and I understand that having worked for Phoenix for 23 years uh, before my latest stint at this department. So I understand those things. I will say to the public, including the businesses that are out there, the golf courses, the agricultural entities, and we all are all very good at conserving water and being efficient. There is certainly more that we can do, but that conservation and those efficiencies have led to the ability for Arizona to contribute to that 70 feet of water in Lake Mead. If those efficiencies and conservation actions hadn't been put in place for the last several decades, we would not have had the flexibility to keep that water in Lake Mead. So it's a cliche to some degree, but every drop does count and it does add up to something significant at the end of the day when we do that efficiency improvement and do the conservation. Anyone else care to pipe in? You've got the, uh, the joint session of the legislature there. Uh, I'll, I'll give it a couple of comments. Um, first, what they're faced with is, is very daunting and very challenging. And uh, I think uh, Dave said it best, and so did Tom, they're balancing a number of constituencies, a number of users to try to come up with the, with the right formula, if you want to call it that. And, you know, in doing so, uh, in that as a backdrop, we're facing unprecedented shortages through the Colorado River system. So our supply is being uh, restricted and starting to, uh, you know, we need to take great care of it. But on the other hand, if you look around the state, we are experiencing phenomenal economic growth here. And that's a balance because economic growth uh, has been good for the state and for all the people living here. So in order for them to take care of a, a supply that's a little challenge right now, to repurpose some of the water priorities against what we would consider core value agriculture because of what's been happening, to look at the new economic development that's happening here and it's changing the landscape quite dramatically. Uh, that's a real challenge. I, I was always impressed when I first met Tom and he put up the chart about, oh, since 1940 something, you know, the population's gone up and the water's gone down and we're doing it and we did a great job. But if you look at, and this isn't anything to do, economic development is good. Some of the economic development that we're getting here right now is just not rooftops. It's large industry, it's high tech, it's all sorts of things that changes that paradigm as we transfer from ag to just rooftops. Now we got a large user sector in there that are de delivering great economic value to the state. But again, it's another stakeholder that these people have to manage. And then obviously last but not least, they can't forget their own constituents, the people whose homes we have to serve. And you know, so they have a huge challenge, but I think the rules that have put in place, the Groundwater Management Act, how that works is the underpinning of what we're doing. Uh, we can't lose sight of that as we move forward. And I think that's gonna be one of their largest challenges as stakeholders all come to the table to look for what they can do together, but also look for what they have to do to take care of their own. So I think they have a very, very daunting challenge in front of them. I, I will add to that just, just a little bit. And I know we're running out of, out of time, Gary, but um, what I would do um, is, is, is remind all the legislators, I don't have a specific suggestion for them, but remind all the legislators that, that when they're considering the various bills that are before them um, or decisions that, that they might make for the good of the state to consider two things, that whatever it is that, um, that they're considering, as has been mentioned before by Tom and others, that there is really no one size fits all type of thing. 
whether it's focusing on a golf course or what ought to be done in a, in a rural uh, farming community or something like that, those type of things generally do not fit for everyone in, in that circumstance. And that's, that's, in my mind, one of the main reasons why some of these things don't move forward is because it, there's no one size fits all. As I said earlier, when it comes to conservation, that the, where the conserved water goes is important. If it doesn't end up in Lake Mead or it isn't accountable to be used for some other beneficial purpose, then there's no real reason to, to, to have an undefined um, um, effort to do something if it doesn't end up where it needs, needs to be. And the same thing for augmentation. If we can't identify when and where and how much is going to happen, and that's the purpose of a lot of these efforts on Bartlett Dam and some of the other things that we've heard about, is to identify when and where and how much is it going to cost and how much water is going to be produced. Um, the, the outcome of these things is, is important and just um, um, our emotional response to, we want to do something because it sounds like a good thing and it will save water without really being able to make that count where it needs to count is, is probably the, the not the best use of our, our time and our money. All right, any last words from anybody else before we, uh, we end the show? Well, Gary, I would just uh, echo what Ted said there relative to some of the legislation that's been brought forward in the, in the past several years. But one of the things that the legislature is rallying around right now is the Arizona Water Augmentation Authority. And, and while there might be different ways to do it, I think everybody at the legislature agrees that that really is going to be the next step for uh, water management in the state um, and going across the boundaries and working regionally with others in the basin as well as Mexico. It's a, it's a critical piece of legislation that's needed in the state. Um, I can tell you from the years that I've worked uh, across the borders and in Mexico on opportunities that, that this is sorely needed in the state to have a, a dedicated agency that can work across the boundaries uh, and, and with other states and other countries as well. So I think the legislature is understands that, how important that is. And I think we'll, we'll get that bill, which will be uh, critical for the state's future. Dave, I just want to make sure folks understand that despite the title, it's not just about augmentation of new water supplies. It's about conservation. It's about recycling. It's about deploying resources that exist in our state, leveraging infrastructure. It's so much more than just augmentation. Uh, and it is a holistic way to look at moving the state forward in a significant way. And I think it is kind of a groundbreaking concept. And we will get there. Uh, with the appropriate structure, which is really what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. We've heard from everyone, stakeholders, legislators that have weighed in that it, it is something needed. The devil's in the details about how exactly to make it work in the best possible way. Well, gentlemen, um, we've come to an hour and I wanna thank you all for um, participating in this. You've all got, uh, you know, we've got a serious problem and um, you guys are, are uh, you know, got very important jobs to do. And I think people appreciate that. And, you know, just sitting here today, I feel a little more confident that, uh, you know, I'm not going to be paying 12 bucks a gallon for water. And, um, you know, so uh, I also want to thank our sponsors, the Central Arizona Project and EPCOR, um, because without them, we wouldn't be having this discussion this morning. And um, <clears throat> once again, thank you to the, the panelists and the viewers who made time this hour to watch. So uh, we'll probably be doing this again in a few months after, you know, the projections come out in August and um, hope you guys can all be here as well. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.